Do you have to be a beast or a bully or a jerk in order to get ahead in life or at work? Or can the nice person finish first? That's what we'll talk about today. Be nice to people on your way up because you meet them on your way down. Jimmy Durante. Today, we're going to talk about a book called Barking Up the Wrong Tree, the surprising science behind why everything you know about success is mostly wrong by Eric Barker. When we're going to talk about the topic I thought was the most interesting from his book, and it's primarily do nice people win or does it take someone to be a bit of a jerk to get ahead in this world, which is a really fascinating topic. I was told by a previous boss I was too nice to get ahead. In a job before this, I was run over all the time because I was always nice and willing to do things. My work life went from 40 hours a week to eventually I had a project that took 120 hours a week. And when my boss saw how good the project was, he said, keep doing it. You're on the right track. 120 hours a week? That's not the right track. But was I that person to say no? Was I the person who was not going to be that super nice doormat and not do it? Nope, I'm not. So this particular topic was really interesting to me. This topic he covers in a way that I found was a little bit different than what I expected. You might think, is it just about the nicest person getting ahead? And it isn't as easy as that because it's not like nice and not nice is a spectrum. We are complex people. And so sometimes what some people consider to be not very nice, other people will consider it to be direct or focused or someone with a different view than us that keeps telling us how different his or her view is. So the first point he likes to bring out is that appearance matters more than actual truth when it comes to the office workplace. Essentially, what your boss thinks of you is more important than the actual work you're doing and that people who made good impressions got better performance reviews than the people who actually worked very hard but didn't manage their impression at all. He quotes an associate business professor at Stanford, Jeffrey Pfeiffer, the lesson from cases of both people keeping and losing their jobs is that as long as you keep your boss or bosses happy, performance doesn't really matter that much. And by contrast, if you upset them, performance won't save you. And I've known people, especially when you work in the technical world, who are real jerks, who aren't very good with people. I had people that I worked with on my team who were terrible to the people that called in asking for support, but technically top notch. They knew their stuff. I think about the show House and how House is a doctor who's terrible. He's awful to people. He's awful to the people around him. But no one is smarter than he is. He knows about so many different rare diseases that he cures all the people. So the question is, would you want to have a doctor like House, the best, the brightest, or would you rather have a doctor who can tell you things in a way that makes sense to you? Maybe they're going to get it wrong, but they're going to be there with their bedside manner helping you feel comforted. And I think I find myself smack dab in the middle. I talked to my mom about this once and she had a doctor she did not like because he told her a truth and she didn't like that very much. Meanwhile, I had a doctor because I'm overweight. I said to her, look, you know, I know I have to lose weight. And she goes, no, 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 you're fine. To me, this was a doctor I could never trust again. She was not telling me the truth. But that doesn't also mean that I want my doctor to be Dr. House. I want someone who is more on the truthful side, but at least somewhat compassionate as a human being. I have a friend who said she would love to have Dr. House as her doctor because she knows that she would always get the right answer. So I think that that scale works out differently for a lot of people. And he said that the unfortunate thing about it is jerks thrive. Jerks do really well. Harvard Business Review mentions another trait on the big five personality test called agreeableness. And you know what? Men who were low in that trait actually made much more money and had better credit scores. They were successful in different aspects of their life. 
And that doesn't seem very hopeful when you're trying to be the nice person. And then he said there's even a different kind of person, which he calls the Moldovan attitude. Not my problem. It's not so much you're being a jerk. You just don't care enough to do any of the things that benefits other people. He brings up the point that the reason that jerks and people who don't care can usually do okay inside of a company is because everyone isn't that way. If we had a whole company of jerks or a whole company of people who didn't care, the company would cease to exist. Bad behavior spreads and it goes from person to person. When someone's rude to you, you're rude to them. And if you work for a place where nobody seems to care about their job, then no one else will care about their job. It brings up Dan Ariely, who is fantastic if you get a chance to listen to him on podcasts or read some of his writings. And he said that when you see other people get away with cheating, for example, other people will start to cheat. If you see other people, in his example, speeding, everyone's going to start speeding. That it spreads throughout a company and it spreads throughout an organization. His joke is that there are three categories, right, wrong, and everybody does it. And if we see other people getting away with something, we assume it's okay to do too. So the question is, is can you get ahead by being selfish, by being a jerk, by really ignoring everything that needs to get done? And he brings up the instance of pirates. Pirates are terrible people. They robbed individuals. They were violent. They did all sorts of horrible things. But there was a certain amount of honor inside that organization. They were trustworthy to everyone else inside the pirate group. Surprisingly, the thing that made them fantastic at their crimes were not the things that made them successful organizations. If there were pirates inside of an organization of pirates that was terrible, didn't care, and was untrustworthy, they often got murdered or booted out of the system. It was the ones who were trustworthy that actually made it. And he brings that point up to modern day gangs as well. Gangs have to trust members inside their own gang. So then he looked at the other side of it and he called these people givers, the people who really look out for other people and try to help other people. They're constantly looking for ways to make other people's lives better. Question is, do these people succeed? And he found that it was interesting because the people who were givers were a lot of times at the bottom of an organization, but they were also overrepresented at the top of the organization. People who are givers can succeed. And the question is, why are some great and why are some not thriving at all? He first points out that the people who were the lowest levels of trust within an organization had an income that was 14.5% lower than the people who had a high or medium high trust level. Question is, why are sometimes these particular untrustworthy people succeeding while the very trustworthy people are doing as well in leadership? Is it that the people who are strong leaders, tough, a little bit jerky, very focused, are those the people who are really going to succeed as long as they don't cross that low level of trust? At least they do moderately well at trust. It might mean, too, that they're missing out on what makes people the happiest. They might be great leaders, but they might not be very happy people, and they might not have a lot of other people in their lives who think they're great either. He says in the short term that people who are being jerks at being cheats really have short-term benefits, but probably don't have long-term benefits. You might see them get a high-paying job because they waltzed into their job interview and they crushed it. And they told their vision and they just smacked it down on the table. Something that a giver would never do. That's too bold. That's too arrogant. And maybe they get that job over the giver. But at a short time, people in that organization figure out this person is not trustworthy, is not someone we even want to have in our company. And Adam Grant answers the question, who is the taker's worst enemy? And he says it's other takers. If you're a jerk, if you take advantage of certain people or situations in a company, there's always someone else who's going to take advantage of it too. And you're going to be a shark in a pond of sharks, each going after each other's position, money, role, esteem. 
But when you're a giver, the other givers in the organization are your help, are your aid. You're all looking out for each other because you're all helping each other succeed. Who you have backing you up is really important when you take a look at these people who are bold, jerky takers and other people who are givers and say, which one is the best way to go? And Adam Grant notes that it's not easy to say why the givers don't always do well. He says that the givers who completely throw themselves at people or individuals always helping other people often get exploited and often get exploited by the takers. And that if they can find some way of building limits so they can actually maybe get their own jobs done, focus on their own vision and stop giving so much of themselves away, maybe they limit their time that they help other people. That's when they can really succeed when they put their efforts in as a limited commodity. I'm going to have office hours. Please come see me if you need any help. Otherwise, I'm going to be working on my own projects. If they can somehow define limits to their helpfulness, this will help them be the giver they want to be without destroying their own achievements, their own jobs, and their own careers. He suggests that 100 hours a year might be the magic number that a giver should give, which is a bit strange to a person who thinks of themselves as a giver because you don't think of it as something that you can control. Oh, it's just who I am. But it turns out that you need to focus on having limits. And that makes sense to me, too, when I think about sometimes there have been projects where I didn't get my own project done inside of a deadline because I was spending so much time helping other people do their projects. Or I'd be burning the midnight oil trying to get my own work done because I spent so much of my time helping other people. Seems like that unlimited giver might be the person who ends up at the bottom because they aren't throttling their time enough to become successful in their own work. So he says that essentially jerks will poison their own wells. Eventually, they'll stop succeeding because they are jerks. And in the long term, givers will pay off because they're helping other people. They're helping their organization succeed. Can they figure out a way of doing it while still focusing on their own projects, their own work? Is there a way that you can do your work, be a great leader, and still feel like you're a human being at the end of the day? He mentions the prisoner's dilemma. And if you haven't heard that, it's um, basically a thought scenario. And a lot of times they talk about how the police will do it. That says, if you confess to a crime, we'll give you a lenient sentence. If your partner confesses to the crime and you don't, you're going to get the hammer put on you with sentencing. Or if you both confess to the crime, you'll both get a somewhat lenient sentence. And so the idea is, do I betray the person I was with to get ahead? Do I stand firm in our cooperative agreement? Nobody says a word or do I never give in? And so that's been kind of a common thought process about how we get ahead. So they talked about different types of testing scenarios about where people were given an advantage if they were allowed to cheat someone else out of something. And what they found was is that the best scenario wasn't either the walking carpet or the unmitigated jerk, it was tit for tat, which means you do something, I do something. I do something, you do something. That each works in the way that reciprocates the work that we're getting from the other person. That way you're not being taken advantage of, nor are you being the jerk. The important thing that when it comes to tit for tat is that you have to be able to forgive. If someone did something harmful to you in the past, forgive them and start them back on the right process again. You think about a country that hates another country, and instead of this outright hate, they do this tit for tat. You act nicely towards me, I'll act nicely for you. If you start holding all the past angers against that group, you'll never benefit. And so that's where forgiveness and not having that deep memory that remembers everything they did to you that was wrong, it's going to help you succeed. You're not remembering an entire history of wrongdoing. And you see that in shows like Survivor and different types of reality TV, where there are people who are jerks. They get voted off. There are people who are doormats. They get voted off, too. A lot of times the people who do well in this type of a show are the ones who treat others well, 
who also treat them well. And you see that in organizations that people who get treated well by other people in their organization will also get treated well by their organization. People are willing to fight for them. I know in my circumstance, I've had people fight for me in my organization because I've always fought for them too. And he says with the tit for tat, and he calls it the generous tit for tat, which means you're always willing to be a little bit more helpful than maybe the other person, but you're only helpful to those people who are helpful to you, kind to the people who are kind to you. It'll prevent you from being betrayed. If you forgive after being betrayed, that generous tit for tat, that's actually the most successful thing. It's not whether you're a jerk or you're the nice person. It's whether you're playing tit for tat properly. And that's really the point of this particular chapter. It's a way of pulling what he calls nice out of the death spiral. And he quotes Adam Grant again when he said that givers often just get the brunt of every bad thing that happens. They're the people who are constantly getting taken advantage of and beat up over the long term. Givers can gain the protection of what he calls matchers, tit for tat. Then their reputation goes up. They start succeeding and they go from the bottom of the pile to the top of the pile. So that's really the important thing. He says, remember in this chapter, reciprocity, tit for tat. Do things for others who will do good things for you. Make sure that you forgive. You don't keep a really long memory of bad things that happened in the past. And don't be that first person who goes after another human being. You're going to respond. You're not going to be the attacker and show people that you can be trusted, that they can like you and really be that example to them. That will allow you to work hard. That'll allow you to get noticed. Make sure that when you're doing tit for tat, don't think about those small issues that come up. Think about the long term. In the long term, the jerks aren't going to win and the tit for tat player will win. So I hope you like this look at the question of whether a nice person can get ahead or how can a nice person get ahead? I liked it because I knew that I had spent a majority of my life as a walking doormat. People took advantage of me all the time. And I think what I learned the lesson is to be a little bit more responsive instead of just being giving all the time to everyone. I was a little bit more discerning and that made all the difference to me. And now our fun entertainment quote of the week comes from Jack Sparrow in Pirates of the Caribbean. Because you and I are alike, and there will come a moment when you have a chance to show it, to do the right thing. I love those moments. I like to wave at them as they pass by. Well, she gave him an opportunity to be a better person. All right, everyone. Thanks so much. Have a great week. And if you have anything to say to me, if you have any questions or a topic you'd like me to cover, you can email me at jill at smallstepspod.com. 